Hello and welcome back to Desperate Living, Cultural Chaos and Forgotten Stories. Today we're going to have a look at Jaws merchandise, of which there was a fair amount at the time it came out, though nothing again, as I often say, to compare with what we see these days. But of course we had um, various magazines and tie-ins, some of them official, such as this poster magazine, um, a lot more unofficial. Jaws was a great way of selling magazines, whether they were movie magazines, um, more political magazines, um, little kind of cash-ins, or of course humour. Um, as well as uh, Mad, we had variations such as action comics, Hookjaw character, the famous ultra gory comic strip, and of course the humorous British comic strip, Gums. But I saw Jaws many, many times in the cinema. Basically, every time it was reissued, I went to see it. It was my favourite film for a very long time when I was young. It really had an impact on me. Here's me in 1976 on holiday wearing my Jaws t-shirt. The first of many that I've owned. And here we have the latest Jaws t-shirt that I have. This one was bought in H&M some years ago and has a kind of plasticky print that's very sweaty for the summer that's actually on the back oddly enough the front of it um, just has this minimal jaws logo so you can look reasonably stylish whilst then flaunting your love for the movie in full glorious color from the back you'll notice incidentally that uh, the swimmer on the t-shirt is nippleless her nipples seem to come and go depending on what piece of artwork you were using my 1976 t-shirt that I was wearing as a young chap actually had nipples on it. Here's the Jaws soundtrack album, which I got in 1976 as a Christmas gift. It's not, I have to say, my favourite movie soundtrack. Obviously the Jaws theme by John Williams is iconic and can't be criticised. It's one of the great scary pieces of music but the rest of the soundtrack I think is a little bit more hit and miss especially when you listen to it out of context the film it's a little bit too jolly and adventurous for a large part but still a nice thing to have and uh, obviously I've held on to it for all these years I believe this is probably the first official movie soundtrack that I ever owned having previously owned um, some unofficial movie soundtracks that we'll kind of come on to in a moment. But here's another great piece of vinyl from around this time. Lalo Schifrin's extraordinarily wild, discified version of the Jaws theme. I'm sure that if you've never heard this and you're wondering how on earth you can turn the Jaws theme into a disco number, well, sadly, I can't play any of it here for you to check out, but there are plenty of places on... Uh, YouTube where you can go and check it out. It was on his album Black Widow. And here's another of those albums that I was mentioning earlier, the unofficial soundtrack, Jeff Love's Big Terror Movie Themes, which of course sells itself very much on the uh, the presence of Jaws. So there's a decent vinyl collection that uh, I've picked up over the years. I think of my all of them, my favourite is the Jaws theme. Let's look at some of the books. Here's the Jaws tie-in novel, which curiously rather plays down the movie, even though you can see that it says on the front, now a major film. So obviously the film was in existence. This edition kind of pre came slightly before the film was pretty much later, finally. Nevertheless, um, it's a thing to be repeated. If you agree that the films are pretty better, it could have and that rather slow. Uh, but then I'll just some moments that... Uh, where the thumbnails would go. A great little big off, but similar to the creation of Cold Disco now King Kong, really, it's surprisingly upfront various rooms the film has. It's got a picture there I can see, but it's certainly trying to make that this was always in the production. So I admire that with an official making of book. Um, Carl Gottlieb obviously was an insider on the film, one of the, uh, one of the writers, and you know, he so he knew all the details, and you know, it's, it's much better to have a book that doesn't try and gloss over things and make everything sound fantastic and brilliant. It just actually goes into the whole movie making experience. So I think this is a book that, you know, if you're into movies, 
into the movie making books, that's one that you absolutely have to have. This is a slightly different one. Edith Blake, who wrote the making of the movie Jaws, was um, a resident of Martha's Vineyard, where the film was shot. And this is very much a book written from the point of view of an islander looking at these crazy Hollywood people coming in and invading their, their rather exclusive summer resort to make this outrageous film. I mean, the book tries to have it both ways. On the one hand, it's being fairly critical of the whole Hollywood machine. Um, but of course, you know, she's trying to make money off the movie Jaws as well, as many of the people in Amity were. Amity, sorry, Martha's Vineyard, the, uh, the place that stood in for Amity. Um, I think with a lot of these situations, you know, the, the locals certainly give as good as they get when it comes to exploitation. The Jaws 2 log, incidentally, is also another must-have uh, if you're into making of movie books. This, again, is um, no nonsense. It, as you're probably aware, Jaws 2 had a very troubled and difficult production, including essentially just scrapping the whole original concept and starting again. And Jaws 2, the Jaws 2 log goes into that in some, some considerable detail. I mean, it's a lot flimsier it's not flimsy but you know it's it's nowhere near as chunky as the jaws log but it certainly sits alongside alongside the um, the previous book and is absolutely something that's well worth having i'm not a huge fan of jaws 2 i have to say but compared to the later sequels obviously it's a bit of a masterpiece and this novelization is very interesting by uh, by hank Searle. it's based as a lot of novelizations were on the uh, early shooting scripts, obviously novelizations tend to be written uh, well in advance of the film coming out. And so this is effectively based on the screenplay that was ultimately junked in order to make the film you know, a more kind of teen-friendly summer blockbuster rather than the rather downbeat dour movie that it might have been. So if you want to get an idea of what that film might have been, this is a really good read. It's certainly, I think, more interesting than the film we finally ended up with. And, you know, it'd be great to see somebody going back to this concept and, you know, trying to explore the idea of, you know, the effects that uh, a, a summer full of shark attacks would have on a seaside town. Certainly, this is one of the more interesting movie novelizations out there. So if you do come across a copy of this, I highly recommend you pick it up. You don't have to be somebody who likes Jaws 2. And, you know, Jaws 2 is not bad. It's not awful. Certainly better than Jaws 3 and Jaws the Revenge. But this was a movie series that kind of went downhill very quickly, I'm afraid. Now, when I did my King Kong video... A few weeks ago, I did say that I'd never owned any other movie-related games, which was actually untrue, because I did own the Jaws game, which this newly purchased Biting Shark from Flying Tiger reminded me of. There is a good reason why I'd forgotten it, because the Jaws game wasn't actually a board game. It was this. Jaws. 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 <laughs> Jaws is the game where you try to fish out what's in the jaws of the great white shark. I'm going for the camera. Made it. But be careful, because if you remove the wrong piece, the jaws will get you. And you're out. Jaws, it's you against the great white shark and each other from Ideal. So yes, the Jaws game was basically a superannuated version of Jack Straws where you would tip the mouth of the shark closed as you took out various objects. This novelty from Flying Tiger that I bought this week is works on the same basis, but is a lot more fun. Now here's some official Jaws merch that I picked up at the time. I say official. Uh, who knows how official all this is? It seems like it's fairly official. This is from a company called Cotter Sports in Northampton in the UK who, as you might imagine, specialised in sports memorabilia for the most part. So sports jewellery, sports toys, sports mugs and the like. But clearly had the Jaws franchise for 
cheap tat in the UK. And this is a, a fun little thing to hang hanging around your neck if you're a kid who's into Jaws, I suppose. I certainly wore this to death, even well into the Star Wars era. There's a photograph of me somewhere posing with somebody dressed as Darth Vader with I still do have this and um, and my Jaws badge uh, on full display. So I wasn't going to just suddenly throw myself in with the new Star Wars lot. Jaws was still the movie for me. But I've held on to it for all these years. Obviously the chain went. It's the kind of thing that probably made your neck go green. But quite nice. And here's something else that's weird that I've managed to hold on to. Again, just sat in a box for decades. A Jaws patch, which I'm pretty sure was sewn onto something. Uh, not sure what it would be, but you know, it's the kind of thing that if you're into Jaws, you will want that on the back of your denim jacket, want it on your jeans, want it somewhere else. And clearly, when whatever piece of clothing it was on was thrown away. I somehow salvaged this and put it aside and kept it. And so it stayed with me for all these years. Unlike the aforementioned Jaws badge, I'm afraid, which seems to have bitten the dust. I certainly don't know where that is. So for once in my life, I actually threw something away, it seems. So now we go back to Cotter Sports for my Jaws mug, which Again, you can see is fairly official. What's interesting about Jaws is that the quote unquote official logo changed from thing to thing. So sometimes it would be the spiky logo. Sometimes it would be the very squared off one that we now are more familiar with the, with the official logo. As you'll see on the mug, yeah, the nipples are missing again. Perhaps not surprising. But yes, this was another treasured possession too treasured to actually use for having hot drinks out of it has to be said or cold drinks for that matter so that's probably why it's essentially survived since 1976. a quick honorable mention to some of the jaws things that i own but no longer have the jaws model kit which was an odd ship in a bottle version not very good as i remember it just wasn't attractive didn't come together very well didn't paint well Here's the copy of the TV Times when Jaws 2 was shown on TV, a rare moment of not having a soap opera on the front cover. And then, of course, in more recent years, there's been lots of Jaws merch um, going for the nostalgia market, including this uh, Jaws breakfast cereal, as you can see. So that's my little haul of Jaws nonsense from back in the day. I haven't really been picking up any of the more recent releases or recent products that have come out. I always tend to think even though this is one of my favorite films and obviously i'll always buy the physical media copies but i don't really need to keep up too much with the merch t-shirts accepted i think if it's not from the time then it's always just more obviously nostalgic and there's certainly nothing wrong with that but that's not really what i'm interested in but anyway if you like this kind of thing then don't forget comment like subscribe and feel free to support us on patreon or buy me a coffee and of course, if you've got any other Jaws merch from the time that uh, passed me by, that I don't have, that I'm unaware of, then by all means, let me know. I'm always interested in seeing more of the authentic Jaws products of the era. So thanks a lot for listening and for watching. I hope you found this entertaining, amusing, informative, whatever. And we'll see you again very soon for more of the same.